he dropped to his knees and didn't say anything. And I just said, is he alive? Is he alive? Your brother pretty much has 48 hours. Prayers, 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 that's all I remember. You know, I'm gonna lose my son. Any minute he could just die. That day the picture came of Blessed Pierre Giorgio. Would you all join me in praying to him? That he needed a miracle and that we needed a miracle, um, that was very comforting. Full of life is the only way to describe Kevin. Just fun, good kid. He was a handful. Just goofy kid, you know, very goofy. When things got exciting, it, it usually involved Kevin. He was really good at soccer. His team, they won like counties, they went to the state finals twice. Had always something to say about everything, um, but he was delightful. You know, I wasn't surprised when we pulled up to this house to see the kind of house that he was gonna be living in. You were hoping that it would be better than it was, but... It was a college mm. house, but he was so proud. And of course, yeah, he was very proud. This is his, this is his place, this is his home. He had called me that, that morning to um, share with me that the cable guy was here. He had to actually go out onto the roof to clean um, back the bushes. He said, Mom, they couldn't get it set up, so I had to go out and I trimmed back the trees and we're all set, we're all connected, we're ready to go. And The first night, like, all my roommates came, like, we were just hanging out on the river saying like how awesome of the year was gonna be and stuff. And like, every single night, we actually just hung out on the river before I got hurt. It was Kevin's girlfriend who called me and said um, Kevin had, um, was in a bad accident and he's very badly hurt. And I said, okay, so where is he? And she said, well, there, he's at the hospital right now. And I said, okay, well, what is he saying? She said, he's not saying anything, Mrs. Becker. I said, well, what do you mean he's not saying anything? We found him outside. He, he, we think he fell from his roof. My grandmother was currently in the hospital. My uncle was in the hospital. Both of them were fighting for their lives. You know, the, it was pretty serious stuff that they were in. So when I, I got woken up, uh, I was pretty scared. We started walking down the stairs, you know, before we even gone past the, the first level of stairs, I go, uh, is it Uncle Sean? He goes, no. I go, Grandma Jean? He goes, no. At this point, we hadn't known yet really where we were because, you know, his girlfriend couldn't tell us that much. But it was when the phone call came in from the hospital, and um, I'll never forget that because Damien took it. He dropped to his knees and didn't say anything. And, and my oldest son just started hysterical crying. And I just said, is he alive? Is he alive? You know, at that point, they were telling him that Kevin was in grave condition, that um, he, they did have him as stable as they possibly could at that point in time, but that they needed to transfer him to a higher level trauma hospital, which they were going to try and do, but that they could not guarantee us that he would be alive when he would get there. So we needed to get to that other hospital and as soon as possible. I just remember my mom just ripped my pillows underneath from my head and I was like, what's going on? She's like, get up, we gotta go downstairs right now. And I was just like, okay. Came downstairs, my mom was racing and I was just slow. And I was like, I gotta go back to sleep. I have football tryouts. And I walk into the TV room and I see Damien's pacing back and forth, like in the doorway. And then my dad's just sitting on his chair, just like staring at the ground, kind of emotionless. My mom's like, Kevin was in an accident. And I'm like, okay, how bad is it? Like, do I really need to go and see him? And she's like, yeah, you kind of do. I was like, really? I need football trials. Like, that always bothered me, that one little part, because I worried about football trials more than my brother. So I was kind of uh, thought about that for a while, kind of. All right, so let's go. And. We all just like grab something. What are we bringing? My oldest ran upstairs and grabbed his rosary beads off of his cross in his room. Um, I went and got my Our Lady of Guadalupe statues um, and anything I knew was a prayer that I felt that I could hold on to because I knew that what we were going to, we were going to need that. And I know you grabbed, what did you, you grabbed your? my Bible. My husband had gotten the call during the evening. He woke me to say, we have to um, get to Pennsylvania. Kevin's been in an accident. You know, the 
it's the fear, it's every, you know, having four children of my own, it's the, your greatest fear of getting a phone call like that. You know, my husband and I were sleeping and the phone rang and it was probably, I want to say about four o'clock in the morning and my brother Hillary was on the phone. He said that Kevin was in a terrible accident. They weren't sure how things were gonna go. And I, I you know, I, like I just burst into tears. The, um, the surgeon had gotten to the hospital and they were trying to move us as quickly as possible. They needed to get him into surgery, but the surgeon wanted to talk to us first. You know, basically I just said to the doctor is, I trust you to do the best that you can. Because they were going in yeah. and inserting two tubes into his head, one to relieve pressure and one to monitor brain pressure. I remember very vividly walking into the waiting room and um, the, I just beelined right to Jean Marie. And uh, you know, I remember her saying to me, thanks for coming, and I just said, where else would I be? When I first saw Kevin, it was, I mean, it was a shock because the amount of equipment that was a part of him at that point was really um, devastating because it seemed like every part of him needed something in order to be there still. I was in fifth grade and the story was spreading throughout the school at St. Raymond's and everyone heard about it from Mrs. Becker because she was the teacher there. She came in and she told us about him and she told us about what happened and she asked us to pray for him. We all started praying for him. Every night at the dinner table we would pray for him. Desperate. It was desperate that he had a fall, that he was uh, in a coma and that things were very, very serious. I'm a speech language pathologist so I know about head trauma and I know about head injury. Um, I was sad. I was very sad for what would be the probable outcome knowing what I know medically speaking. So we prayed, we prayed a lot. They generally felt that they had like uh, two to three days to save his life. Uh, and Kevin wasn't getting any better. I mean, he wasn't getting worse, worse, but he certainly wasn't doing anything that they would feel encouragement by. He started running high fevers. He started, he had pneumonia. He started getting nasal infections. His, his fever at one point was like 105 and they had to put a cooling blanket over him. Um, just seeing such a vibrant person in a coma and not responsive at all and then his head had been shaved and he has the most amazing hair. So his head had been shaved where they had, you know, done some work and he had stuff and so physically he looked kind of scary. Uh, one of the members of the, the trauma neuro uh, team is doing making his rounds and they come up to Kevin's room and he gets the rundown from the nurses and and I just remember him saying you know you can't go on like this forever I mean time is running out his and brain like, pressure was spiking really yeah, his high. brain his brain pressure like whenever they tried to reduce the propofol the to, to test to see how he was doing yeah so they just would to test see him. like within two minutes would just go and then they would have to be, then they'd be like, dangerous. Mr. Becker, we gotta bring it back down. Cause they would try to ask me to help Kevin to like do something. It was just day to day, almost minute to minute, you know? And I just remember there was this one point where they were just waiting for him to give the thumbs up. He would just give the thumbs up. And I remember being in the, in the room with him when it was my turn and just looking at him and just screaming in my head, please Lord, please let me have a thumbs up, you know? And uh, it was just, moment by moment we just never knew you just never knew we just the, the hope was always there never to give up hope um but it was also very scary that yeah he might he might die he might not die and the fear of him not dying was what are we going to get what kind of kevin are we going to have after this is all over and i think that was my biggest fear was that he was not going to be able to be who he was so dame and i are just sitting in there and this doctor you know says let me just explain to you uh, what I'm thinking is going to happen at this point. We can't keep Kevin the way he is anymore. And he said the only other option is that we're going to just put him completely under. The medically induced coma, and he said, you know, like it's for like two weeks. If we do that, he may never come back. It wasn't good. You know, and hearing that your brother 
pretty much has 48 hours and we're gonna have to try something else but death is possibly coming it uh certainly you know changes everything i was trying to accept the fact because it was it seemed from what everyone was looking like that he wasn't it, the odds were not in his favor he's either gonna die but if he doesn't die he will remain in a coma for the rest of his life until you decide to put his, you know, end his life. Or if he survives, he'll be really funny. So anytime um, the doctors would say anything and I would just have to go through my head, my God is greater than that mountain over and over. If I was in his room, I was on my knees by his bedside uh, praying over him. And then I would leave and say, I have to go pray, and that's all I can do right now, Kev. I, I can't stay with you. I can't see you like this. My niece, Beth, who lives in California, had um, contacted us and said, listen, get everybody praying for Pierre Giorgio. He needs another miracle to become a saint. This might be the one. Now, me being, listen, anybody you throw at me, I'll, I'll do it. You know, I always pray to every, all my people. So just add a person on. So that's when we all first heard of him. And we said, sure, you know, he was a young guy, very athletic. I said, hey, this sounds like our guy. My niece had sent us the Divine Mercy prayer and then blessed um, Pierre Giorgio and gave us, you know, the prayer to say. And, and especially to have a particular saint to pray to, especially that he needed a miracle, and that we needed a miracle, um, that was very comforting. My relationship with God is he talks to me through music. And so I think that was a part of my prayer, is like I was holding on to what people were telling me. And I, at one point I said, I'm holding on, but I need to hear from you in my special way. For whatever reason, I would probably wake up at around 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, I was just flipping through the channels and there was the rosary with the Mother Angelica and I left it on. So we would wake up to EWTN and every morning probably around seven o'clock there's like a, a kids show. So day eight, you're in the bathroom getting ready, I'll never forget it. And I had not listened to any music up until this point and um, the scripture verse of the day was the scripture verse that hangs in my classroom. And then they go into this song and it's a very catchy song. Um, it, it cast your burdens onto Jesus. Higher, 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 higher. There he goes, higher. cast your burdens, burdens. onto Jesus, mm -hmm. for he cares yes. for you. That's it, yeah. Higher, yeah. higher. And they're all walking around, and I'm listening so to I was this. hearing this while I'm in the, in the bathroom. in the bathroom, and he doesn't sing, he doesn't hum, he doesn't do yeah, anything. I don't sing, I don't have a good voice. And I'm listening to this, and I said, all right, I'm casting. You know, I remember sitting on the edge of the bed going, I'm casting them. I'm casting him, Jesus, you got him, you know? And, and he starts walking by me and he's humming the song. And he's going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I'm like, <laughs> I don't believe this is happening. He doesn't hum, like I've never heard it. And I, like I've told people often, this was the first time out of those eight days that I could walk over to the hospital and not be terrified. That day the picture came. That day the picture came of Blessed Peter Giorgio. At the end of the day, like the, they do uh, an, what they call a neuro test. Mm -hmm. So like the, the thumbs up thing is a huge thing. So the other thing is like wiggling the toes and he couldn't do any of that. And then, you know, to even see if he can sense any pain, like they do some really pain, like they take a, like a sharp object, sharp ob object and like stick, stick it, it into his, his foot, right? Then Kevin like started you know, pulling away, and the doctor, that was the day, the doc, this particular doctor said, okay, that's good, I know he's in there. That, that was the day, day eight was when Kevin opened his eyes, and he, um, he gave me the hug that I had been waiting for since he had, was in the accident, and that's all I wanted back, and I knew with that hug that I prayed for that I had my son back. You know, I was the communicator, and every day I would write, you know, what happened that day. Some of it was, of course, for the most part, was fairly serious, and keep on praying and keep on praying. 
I was actually in the room when Kevin finally said words. Like when they officially said he was awake. That was pretty big. It was like a relief, you know, it was like a... I was like, all right, so now we got this. And, you know, he opened his eyes, we got the thumbs up. You know, now next thing is, let's get him off the breathing tube. Let's get the, the tubes out of his head. And, you know, let's, let's take it one step at a time. It was, uh... Me and my dad, <laughs> like, uh, Kevin had those little mitts on, you know? <laughs> and he, like, lifted his hand up and I grabbed it. And he said he loved me. <laughs> when Kevin put his thumbs up and opened his eyes, for me, that was, a, that was the miracle. That was the miracle to have Kevin, however Kevin would be, Kevin was back. And then when he called me a loser, <laughs> I think Kevin, the Kevin, Kevin was back. And I walked in and he was in the bed with his eyes open, sitting up, able to really recognize me. It was, I can't even describe the feeling. But we had to go to the house, the, the hotel thing that we were staying at that was affiliated with the hospital, just to pack up. And, uh, you know, I had a football lane in the car. And we just started tossing. And that was really cool. Probably wasn't the best idea either. Probably dangerous. <laughs> so I was firmly believed that we were going to have to help him for the rest of his life. I was convinced I would wipe drool off his face. All those things that the doctors were saying were supposed to happen and him not come back from a soccer game complaining how he got stepped on. His middle initials M and I changed it from Kevin Matthew to Kevin Miracle and that's just what it was and what it is. On the last morning of the hospital Kevin had mentioned to me that you know an angel was with him and the angel kept him safe. Like the first time I met Giorgio um, you know I woke up in my free time you know it just seemed you know I, you know, I'm usually the first one awake in my house. I'm always the, the early riser. Like I, was, I would go to like the 7.30 mass. And, you know, my room was a very normal bedroom, where I guess, for me at least, it was normal. I had a futon, TV, Xbox 360, and FIFA. All right, that's all I had, that's all I needed. I start hearing things downstairs, and you know, I just figured, you know, it was one of my roommates. This is where I see this guy, you know, this young guy and stuff, and I was like, who are you, man? And he goes, I'm your new roommate. And I'm like, that, that can't be, because I already, I have two roommates, you know, their names are Nick and Joe, and he just goes that you don't have to worry about them for now. Right, what, you know, whatever. New roommate, cool, awesome, new person to meet. So I'm like, who are you? And he goes, I am Giorgio. And I'm just like, all right, Giorgio, it's nice. I'm, I'm Kevin, nice to meet you. You know, it was kind of like a, a working relationship. Um, we were working on making the perfect room, perfect room that, like, you know, for myself, for all my friends, for all of us to hang out in. And then when I was done with that, I would go back upstairs into my room, play video games, play FIFA most of the time, and, you know, even do schoolwork. And that, it seemed like he was doing everything in his power to keep me there. So, like, eventually I'm gonna get aggravated, so eventually I'm gonna try to get out of my house, and that's the thing that I always remember is him saying, you're not ready yet to go out there. And I never knew exactly what that meant, and I still don't know what that meant. So it was the next day, we were home, it was a beautiful day, and um, we decided to go for our walk. And as I'm walking with him, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing, and I was just like in awe. My mom goes, Kevin, hey, uh, why don't you tell Damien what you told me? And I was just kind of like, eh, so what's up, Kev, what do you gotta tell me? He goes, well, when I was in my coma, there, there was an angel with me. First of all, to hear Kevin talking about an angel, that's something in and of itself. He never saw Pierre Giorgio. Like, he, we never told him that we were praying to him. It was when we, the first day he came back. My mom goes, if I showed you a picture, would you be able to identify this picture as your angel? She shows me the picture. And he just looks at it, and he goes, that's him. 
that's the guy. He's like, that's the guy that was in my dream, telling me not to like leave my room or anything. That's the guy. With God's gracious mercy and his love for us, and of course, especially for Kevin, he chose the perfect saint for the miracle. You know, both athletic, both funny, uh, both really enjoy being with their friends and the youth. You know, you hear about miracles your whole life. And you've heard about this miracle, and you read about the miracles in the Bible, and you hear about the ones all over the world. But what a blessing to be able to witness one firsthand and, and to be able to talk about it. It's absolutely miraculous. I mean, you would never know he fell. You truly wouldn't know. I mean, he does everything he did before. I know that Pier Giorgio was a guy's guy, that he was just a regular guy, but he also had this deep faith. He made bets with his friends that if he made it down the mountain first, then he would have, they would have to go to mess with him. No, he was very athletic. He's Italian. I'm Italian. Um, he was a good person. He helped the poor a lot. He died when he was young, very young. He was part of the St. Vincent de Paul Society. He had a deep devotion to the poor. I know the most significant one was he would always climb mountains. He would always want to do that so he could be closer to God, like his like, saying, versa alto, to the top. A lot of saints that you hear about that are in some sort of order even, like priest to sister, and to hear that Pier Giorgio wasn't is different, makes him different. He lived life to the fullest, I think. It shows that you don't have to be like, in your 50s to be a saint. They grew up, if he, Kevin had grown up in Turin, Italy with them, I'm sure they would have been good friends. When Kevin was first um, back home and he was going for speech therapy at a speech pathology place, um, and I'd taken him to a couple of appointments, and I would sit there with him, and he would go in, and I would see young men his age and coming out, barely able to walk out, who have just had a traumatic brain injury as well. And I would just say, Kevin, look at these people. And, and look at you, you know, and he barely needed the therapy, you know, he was just going through the motions and to me it was continuous seeing people in his, that could have been him and it, it was a constant reminder of what a miracle it was when you, when you would be physically in a place and you would see young men coming out and not being able to communicate at all, not being able to even really walk correctly and there he comes bounding out, hey Geraldine, let's go, you know, I'm done. And I'd say, look at this, Kevin, look at this boy, you know. How there but for the grace of God and, and, and your miracle and blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati and everyone's prayers. And that could have been you, but it's not. And he recognized that. And that was the beauty in it all, that he knows that could have been him. So. What's going on? Why am I recovering so much quicker than my friend Jordan, than this other guy, than this other guy? There's people been in this class for six months, some with some, some severe head injuries and some with concussions. And I fractured my skull in five places. I had fully injured basically every single lobe of my brain. My brain shifted by a centimeter. Basically, my brain was, was mush and I was healing that much faster. It was, it was just, it's, it's been so wonderful to watch and just every little thing that happens to him, you just think, oh, we could have missed that. And it's just, it's such a blessing to still have him and have him back. Yeah, he's definitely the same person. I, I would say, you know, I, I think because of it though, um, you know, we're definitely more spiritual. What, how, why? Why me, why me, why me, why? I always, I always tell my mom, why me, why me, why me, why me? I'm here now, and I know at times why me. I'm a, I'm a new picture, I'm a different person. I can help another person become something that he deserves to be. And I was chosen to show people that there is something to believe in, that there is a God. He loves us so much that he forgives us. And that's one of the biggest things that I've learned in my life is forgiveness and I've, I've learned to love a lot more. If God can do this for me, imagine what he can do for you. There are miracles in this world. They go on. They happen to everyday people. Um, everyone is worthy of one. God chooses, you know, for whatever reason why someone has one and someone doesn't. The hand of God came down 
you know, and, and touched our family in such a way just because of his gracious mercy. I mean, that's it. There's a hope um, in a world that, you know, where they're saying God doesn't exist. He's very alive and well and very present if you let him. Yep. You, you don't know what you, you have until you truly are very close to losing it and stuff. So I would just say I'm much more grateful for what I have now. I mean, I'm a very active person and I'm, you know, I'm training little kids in soccer and I can guarantee you if I was hurt, I would probably have never been training two to four year olds. I would have never thought that it's like proper for me. I would like actually be coaching older kids. So I kind of like see myself doing more things that are very, you know, Giorgio Fasati the like. I fully believe that the reason why I'm here is because God wanted me to be here. And do I know exactly why he wanted to be here? No. And am I going to, do I worry about it? Not really. I just continue on living and keep on trying my hardest to be the best person I am every single day.